Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's panel. Um, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Randa Relish Milleron. Um, she is the CEO and co-founder and director of marketing of Mojave-based rocket and satellite manufacturing company, Interorbital Systems. Randa's professional experience spans aerospace, media, the arts, and academia. In addition to her duties as an executive and scientist at Interorbital, she is an award-winning television director, producer, video artist, electronic musician, and a professor of communications currently with the University of Phoenix. She holds a BA in philosophy and an MA in African languages from Duquesne University with additional studies in chemistry at Cal Poly Pomona. Fond of combining engineering and academics, her specializations are the development and use of high temperature composite materials and STEM outreach um, curricula development. Randa is a serial entrepreneur who also co-founded and is active in the space tourism company Astro Expe uh, Expeditions and the nonprofit educational organization Translunar Research, a scientific think tank dedicated to the exploration, colonization, and commercial exploration of the moons in our solar system. Everyone, please when, welcome Randa. Randa, you're on mute. Sorry about that. There I am. Okay. Yeah, nice to be with you. And um, I'll bring up uh, uh, some information and an introduction to our, our uh, company. So, uh, a second here. There we go. And. Okay, writing this. Yeah, um, you know we get, we hear a lot about uh, democratizing space, and and uh, for those who are who are looking to do uh, any sort of on orbit uh, experimentation work, uh, you know, um, exploration, tourism, any any of those uh, those items, uh, uh, the the main factor that that is uh, kind of the um, you know the gate that keeps people out of that sector is is pricing, and uh, if you haven't priced any space flights yet, you're you're um, probably in for some sticker shock because it's in the you know uh, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we at Interorbital have been working uh, for uh, you know over two decades. So on creating a system that uh, basically strips away uh, the unnecessary parts of rockets, where we're making what is essentially a space truck uh, rather than the Ferrari. We're, we're making a vehicle that uh, can be mass produced rapidly uh, for low amounts of money and uh, will in turn give access to space to people who have formerly been underserved. Uh, we have a small team, uh, six people, and we've uh, developed uh, four major rockets over the last, uh, again, two decades here at the Mojave Air and Spaceport where we headquarter our company and have, uh, have our test sites, manufacturing areas. Um, but uh, the company was founded uh, by my husband and myself and we have uh, four, what I like to call, uh, and what Steve Job used to call the A plus uh, engineers. You know, the small A plus team can run circles around the, a, a gigantic B or C team. And we, we believe that is the case. So we function that way. And, and again, it functions like the old style rocket team. Everybody participates in everything essentially and know all workings of the vehicles intimately. Um, what may be of interest to the audience today is uh, the small satellite uh, cargo delivery that um, we've built uh, uh, a vehicle called the Neptune. That's our 
go-to workhorse for satellite delivery and our orbital demonstrator vehicle. But we also build the satellites and we build satellite kits. Um, we've uh, brought pricing down on the kits for STEM uh, programs. They're now popular in about 25 uh, countries globally. The use our kits as the core of their, their STEM curricula. Uh, but you, you still have this extremely high price uh, of launch and um, you know you can you can spend you can spend five hundred thousand dollars to launch a small satellite if you don't look around you know and uh, uh, I know I think SpaceX was offering uh, something like five five thousand per kilogram but that requires you to buy a, a million dollars worth of cargo space so again out of you know out of the the um, reach of of most citizen scientists I would say. So it's still a complex process because you have to go through, uh, in, in some cases, a spacecraft manufacturer, uh, through a broker, to a launch provider, and also get someone to do the tracking for you. So this becomes, uh, you know, uh, more than than most groups or people can handle, uh, who have a, a limited budget and a limited team. Uh, our solution to that is um, just to be vertically integrated, completely offering all services you know, in, in, uh, you know, in one location. And to, to make those, uh, those test launches of, of um, you know, future space uh, technology, uh, to make that truly cost-effective, uh, we're, we're pushing for a uh, under $5,000 uh, a kilogram. And that's no minimum purchase, no, no million dollar purchase needed. Uh, we've done this by radically simplifying not only the rocket, but also the, um, our concept of operations and how we launch. Uh, and we would call that an end-to-end -end solution because it is. It's everything from uh, rocket engines all the way through to the satellite payloads themselves. Um, our competitors are all the usual suspects. Uh, you can see them there. Uh, no, no competitor really provides all three services. Many are planning on it, uh, but we we fill a void by centralizing all the design, build, and launch, and data services required for space access, and to uh, offer those to our customers. Uh, and again, those customers range from you know, NASA groups to uh, uh, Nigerian universities to. Uh, uh, noodle programs for advertisers. You know, it's just it's it's a very diverse and and uh, sometimes bizarre and eclectic uh, set of uh, payloads that that we launch. But uh, uh, the core, again, workhorse for the for the company for interorbital is is the Neptune rocket, and you see it on the left there in a test flight of uh, it's a prototype. Uh, for the uh, booster stage of it, what will be a two-stage orbital vehicle. So we've flown, uh, we've flown the uh, propulsion systems for the uh, booster stage and for the upper stage. And now we're involved in, uh, in flight testing the complete orbital stack or both, both stages put together. Uh, we expect to begin clearing our, our uh, payload manifest, which now holds at least 175 unique uh, satellite units uh, and uh, probably 150 to 160 different customers. Uh, we be, we'll begin that, uh, it, it looks like uh, at the, uh, sometime this time next year. And um, we look forward to clearing that rapidly because we can launch 80 kilograms uh, of, of um, satellites on these, uh, on, on these Neptune vehicles. Uh, the satellites I mentioned are, are um, essentially pre-built or 2.0 models are built for ease of assembly and uh, they can be assembled in hours and they are actually fully functioning uh, spacecraft that will perform uh, uh, communication and uh, other electrical needs uh, that any experiment might want. Uh, and we also offer a re reconfigurable mobile ground station. So we, we currently have in development and uh, services uh, for data downlink. Uh, 
to Neptune, a little bit more about that. Uh, again, I mentioned that we, we, uh, we achieve an ultra low cost and by an ultra low cost in the space world, I mean uh, a, a, tr a rocket that will take 80 kilograms to orbit for under a million dollars. That's, that's unheard of today. That is cheap by uh, aerospace standards. So the um, uh, Neptune itself, again, is, is a two-stage vehicle. It's, uh, uh, again, it's, its engine is made here in-house, tested here. Uh, we use what's called differential thrust steering. So we have a very simplified vehicle. We've eliminated turbo pumps, which are failure prone and very expensive by using a pressure fed system, proprietary system. And um, it's, it's uh, basically uh, as, as, as minimalized as you can get. We use concepts like subtractive design and minimum cost design to, to create these vehicles. And, and it's paid off with what is the world's lowest cost orbital launch vehicle. So we can offer true launch on demand because of the way we launch. We have two methods and you can see at the bottom of the page, the uh, land launch system, which is uh, essentially an erector that uh, can be taken, driven anywhere. It's built for uh, launching from austere locations because we are in a, <laughs> in a very austere location here in the Mojave Desert with no uh, facilities around. So we take everything with us and uh, a launch from the middle of nowhere. So this is uh, you know, very attractive to many different groups because uh, you can literally launch it from your backyard if needs be. Um, um, the launches can be done with a crew of four. So again, simplifying manpower needs. Uh, the um, goal that we're, we're looking for, for, for uh, as we're, we're setting up a production line currently, is to produce a rocket a day. Uh, that seems, uh, you know, uh, like a cool goal, but it is t entirely doable. This is the, the really the secret sauce, I guess, in our in our program, which is to avoid uh, federal spaceports and become a spaceport of our own. Now, in this case, we're launching from a barge. Uh, the first launches will occur off the coast of California and with the southern, southern launch um, inclinations uh, to do polar orbits with CubeSats. And um, uh, the Neptune will go from ocean to orbit and uh, we can offer, uh, again, rapid response launch and to the lowest cost. Uh, and because of the type of launch we're doing here, which is, again, this private spaceport, uh, we don't get in the big waiting lines that uh, other providers uh, experience when they go to, uh, to the spaceports. I'm talking about Vandenberg or the Cape or Wallops. Uh, this, is, this is a unit that can be duplicated and uh, we could have these on the East Coast, the West Coast or wherever, you know, if someone needs them. Uh, to do rapid response launch. Uh, these rockets can be ready to launch in a matter of hours. And um, that's really uh, how we planned the whole, the whole um, uh, program was to be able to, uh, to do that much sought after launch on demand. So it's essentially a mobile space port. We get a launch license for a particular latitude and longitude and that, that becomes our launch zone. Uh, you can, See here, we have a, um, a huge uh, price uh, difference with the existing launchers. And these prices mean, uh, you know, the ability to launch for, uh, for again, uh, underserved or underfunded uh, groups and institutions. Uh, the Neptune, again, is, is going for under a million dollars. Everything else is many, many millions more. Our, our follow-on vehicle, which is the Triton, which is a heavier uh, lift vehicle, which uh, will carry 2,100 kilograms to orbit, is, has a $10 million price tag. And if you look at other comparable rockets, they're 50 million, yeah, 30 million, just much, much more at any rate. Uh, the Triton Heavy, which we're, we're going to be using for uh, cargo hauling and uh, 
lunar missions uh, carries uh, 6,100 uh, kilos to low Earth orbit and is 16 million. So these, these well, that seems high. Again, in aerospace terms, it's, it's nothing. It's a coffee budget. <laughs> uh, back to the uh, satellite kits. Uh, we've, um, so we started uh, offering these in 2009. So we're, we've been a STEM education leader in this field for, you know, for over a decade. And uh, we have our own uh, form factor, which is a tube sat, which is, um, I believe, the least expensive uh, satellite kit and launch offer in the world. Uh, you get a kit with, of a, uh, that can be built into, a, again, a fully functioning spacecraft. And that starts at $12,400 if you're an academic group. If you're not academic, it's twice that price, but it's still inexpensive. The CubeSat, which is the more common form factor, is uh, $22,000 for academic. And um, those of you who aren't familiar with the satellites uh, that we're talking about, the small sat world, uh, this is a whole new uh, sector and probably the fastest growing sector in aerospace. Uh, they will go from uh, what you see in the photograph uh, above are one unit uh, items. So they can go from one to 24U uh, configurations uh, very common configurations in this case uh, for, for uh, small satellites. Uh, well, the one unit can be assembled in four hours with virtually no skills. Um, all the basic functions are included. And again, you would be, as, as the owner of this spacecraft, your job is to design your own application or experiment that uses this, which is essentially an on-orbit bus that provides electrical power and uh, communication uh, from orbit. So, um, but we can, um, we can apply these same, uh, these same methodologies uh, for larger satellites and we do a lot of uh, custom work as well. Some, some work for a Mideast uh, AMSAT uh, repeater that we're doing now and some others that are of note. We also have uh, ground stations that we're going to be um, offering uh, and, and again, under 15,000 per station that fit in a cargo container. And again, this gives the underserved nations or the, who want to be spacefaring nations and uh, other groups a chance to participate in uh, you know, the big gold rush of space. We have a 12 year plan. Um, we founded uh, uh, interorbital. We also founded um, Translunar Research, which is uh, a, uh, think tank that uh, is dedicated to the colonization, uh, the commercial exploitation of the moons of the solar systems. So, so um, uh, we're planning to use heavier lift rockets and uh, those that are in the uh, design uh, queue now coming up. Uh, we have lunar missions coming up. Of our, our first lunar mission will be a uh, lunar impactor. We're doing that with uh, Ed Bell Bruno's uh, innovative orbital design company. And we're uh, going to smash a rocket into the moon. But before that, um, before that rocket hits and uh, we're able to like analyze the ejecta that come from that, we will eject from the rocket a uh, small lunar lander that you see on the, on the surface here would come down and land on the airbags and then unfold. And that would carry four experiments. So th that's, that's our lunar station. Uh, we're looking at human space flight. Uh, we've been working on that uh, since the beginning. We're, we're coming up with a, uh, a space tourism flight that'll carry two people. Uh, it's uh, a $10 million per person mission, but that's uh, half a day in orbit, roughly eight orbits. And uh, that is actual real space flight in orbit, just like the one you saw on SpaceX recently, which is, you know, that was a fabulous, uh, a fabulous venture there. The fact that they were able to take uh, four relatively untrained people and uh, have them enjoy that great ride and the great views from space. So that again is coming up for interorbital as well as unmanned and manned deep space interplanetary missions to Luna Venus. 
and beyond. And Venus is very close to our hearts. We love uh, the idea of um, doing a uh, a cloud city in on Venus. And actually, I put a link to uh, an article I wrote in 2004, actually, for Ad Astra uh, about the floating cities of Venus. And it's there. It's also on our website under destinations. It's my contact information. If anybody has any questions, I'd uh, love to hear from you. So uh, that's basically it. That is the interorbital story. Thank you so much, Randa. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to switch over and in continuation of our democratizing space access, I'd like to introduce Crystal Azelton. Um, and before I do that, I do just want to remind everyone to please send your um, questions either through the Q&A or the chat, and we will answer those shortly at the, towards the end of the program. So, um, Crystal Eiselton is the Director of Space Applications Programs at Secure World Foundation and has over 10 years of international and domestic space, public policy, and management experience. Prior to joining SWF, Ms. Eiselton was a consultant at Access Partnership, where she worked with international satellite service providers and other leading technology companies on policy issues and related to spectrum management, emergency communications, telecommunication standards, orbital debris, and multilateral processes, including representing industry at the Inter-American Telecommunication Commission. She has also served as a project manager at the Tory Group, a leading aerospace analytics firm, providing research analysis, strategic planning, and regulatory access to government and commercial um, clients. She led and supported production of NASA's strategic plans, audits, performance plans, budgets, and annual reports. Her work exposed um, her work exposed to a full range of NASA's Earth observation human exploration and aviation programs. In that role, she was also recognized as a key member of a data management team that received the NASA Group Achievement Award. Crystal, welcome. Great, thank you so much for having me, Randa. Can you hear me okay? Hello. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thanks. So thank you, Randa, right. for that great introduction right. to this topic. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, so if you can just let me know that everything works okay here. All right, All right how's that look? Looks good. Excellent. All right. So hi, everybody. Um, I am, as you just heard, Crystal Azelton. I am with the Secure World Foundation, and I'm excited to be speaking with you here today. Um, what I'm going to actually talk about is, is kind of take a step back and interpret this title. Um, very differently. So Randa just gave us this really great overview of what core organization is doing and how we can think about democratizing act, space access in a very kind of literal way, like how do we get there? Um, and given what the scope of my organization, what I'm going to do is take a step back and talk to you a little bit about um, space access in, in a broader sense. So uh, you know, data, satellites themselves, and, and space sustainability. So I hope that's of interest to everyone. Um, Sorry, that looks good. So just a little bit about Secure World Foundation for anyone who is not familiar. So we are a private operating foundation, a nonprofit um, that promotes cooperative solutions for space sustainability. And I think that can, um, it's kind of a buzzword and a catchword, but for us, what that means is that because there's an increasing reliance on space assets, as well as destabil potentially destabilizing trends, we've made it our mission to work with governments, with industry, with international organizations, with civil society, and our job is to try to promote and develop ideas and actions to achieve, and this is what's really important to us, the secure, sustainable, and peaceful uses of outer space, benefiting Earth. And we're going to talk a lot more about that throughout this presentation. Um, just so you kind of know how we do our work, we're not really a think tank. Um, we do some research, but we kind of have a, a multitude of roles. So we are a research body, um, also a convener and a facilitator to examine uh, key space policy topics. So what is the goal? And, and I, I know that this is kind of a mixed audience. So I, I think a lot of us think space is really cool and we're excited to be part of this industry and we're excited to be here. 
But at the end of the day, my organization is really focused on the benefits of space. And so for us, we call that human environmental security. You can call it a lot of different things. But the idea that our activities in space, the wide variety of them, they benefit people and they benefit the earth. And we think that that's really important. And we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about space sustainability and when we're talking about access to space, um, because that really for us is the point of all of this. And so the context of space benefits for humanity can't be overstated. Um, again, I think this is something that when you're in the industry, you often look past or you, you, you kind of focus on what your piece of it is. Um, but this isn't something that everybody understands. You know, space is kind of sometimes just this exciting thing. We've got a lot of like rockets and tourism right now, uh, which is getting a lot of press. But the, the bread and butter of the space industry is, is really about the data and the way that we use what comes from space. And so that's a really important part of trying to think about how we have access to space, who has access to space, who has access to space data. And so that's what I want to talk about uh, with you all today. And so just to give a little bit of background, because again, I know we have a mixed audience here, so I won't take too long on these slides, but I think it's really important to actually put this in context. Um, this is a really simple chart and a really simple slide, but it really shows you um, where we've come in just, you know, 15 years and the number of satellites in space, it actually keeps growing. This, this chart happens to cut off of 2019. It went through 2021, um, that line would keep growing, going up. And it almost looks like an exponential curve, right? Um, it may or may not be, that's, that's not for me to say, but the, the increase that we've seen in the 2010s is, is huge. And it's not just the number of satellites, it's also who is actually launching and, and controlling satellites. So this is a map, if you look at what's colored orange, um, those are the countries that had, were considered space countries in 1966. That map would have been 2016. So all of those years later in the course of what is that 50 years uh that map changed a lot and it, it's changed even a little bit since 2016 and it continues to change in terms of uh the expanding cubesat market and, and who's gaining access to space and so it continues to change we want to see that change um and we want to talk a little bit about what that kind of kind of means um the actual satellite industry today so a lot of those new satellites and, and even some of those countries um, is because the industry itself is changing. We've had um, booms in the past in terms of commercial space activity, but that only continues. And so this is a really great infographic. I encourage you to take a look at this actual report uh, by the Satellite Industries Association. This is from their 2019 report, um, but you can actually get ones from 2020. And this will really give you the, the context of how much money is in the industry, where it's going, um, and what's happening. And again, all of these are access issues, right? So who, you know, ground equipment, um, satellite services, you know, just really trying to understand where the money's at, where it's going, and the increasing growth and how much it's growing per year really gives you a sense of, of the growing number of actors that are involved in this conversation. So it's also grown more commercial. So if you actually take a look at this, um, you'll notice that it's blue and red in the beginning because that represents civil government and military government. And that's pretty much how it continues through the 1960s, the 1970s, 1980s starts to change a little, the 1990s really starts to change. By the time you get to the 2010s, that green bar, uh, which is commercial space activity, and the pink bar, amateur, academic, and other, have really grown to dominate the chart. And that's really what Randa was talking to you about when she's talking about CubeSats and, and who's launching. That's really changing and it's going to continue to change. And so it's not just what are the applications and more countries, it's also, you know, who is actually managing these satellites. And this is also really important because we need to talk about space data and, and what are the trends in what's coming out of space. And so if you look back, um, you know, a historical assessment and then kind of a future assessment. Um, you're going to see a real shift in terms of communications. Um, is it really expected to grow? That's a lot to do with planned um, LEO communication satellites. The Earth observation remote sensing portion actually shrinks a little bit in terms of um, percentages if things continue. Scientific holds fairly steady um, and technology shifts a little bit as well. And so this is a, a pretty broad categorization of, of satellites, but we're, we're seeing a shift in what the satellites themselves actually do in terms of the numbers that are up there. 
And then this is just one way to look at the future. I think most of us here know that this is going to continue if, if the launch industry continues the way uh, Randa was laying out for us. Uh, we're really going to continue to see that trend um, in the future. And this is just for small um, nanosats and microsatellites. So this is just kind of a microcosm here of what we're talking about. Um, but again, it gives you a sense of what people are predicting. And so kind of moving back to, to space data and really thinking here for a minute about what are we using it for? Who has access to it? What are the benefits? Um, and so the, the benefits for global initiatives is, is really huge. Um, sustainable development goals are a perfect example. So they were established in 2015 um, through the United Nations. I think the final count was about 130 countries signed on. Uh, there are 17 goals. And if you examine them, space applications are applicable to all 17 goals. <laughs> Um, everything from poverty mapping to disease mapping, infrastructure planning, you can see some of the case studies that I've highlighted there along the side. Um, but there's really sort of the traditional ways we think of space data, you know, agriculture, um, managing our oceans, that sort of thing. But the, the new and innovative applications just continue to grow. Um, there's been some great stories about tracking illegal fishing, um, human rights monitoring. Um, via high resolution data has, has actually been even far out of its infancy. It's really been developed since about 2005. Um, even democracy and governance, you know, if you're talking about elections work in another country, you know, understanding using satellite data for planning, for districting, for even potentially monitoring data, you know, the, the number of applications, I won't say it's limitless, but it's incredibly high and, and people are very interested in it. And it really feeds into what the global community is trying to do, because not only do you wanna to try to make improvements in all 17 of these areas, for instance, but you also need to track how you're doing. And space data has a really important role for that. Um, this is also important for other initiatives. I chose to highlight the sustainable development goals here, but you could have just as easily um, talked about climate change, about the Paris agreements, um, about disaster management more specifically. Um, I think these are really nice because it shows you the breadth of space applications and, and really trying to understand that if we're talking about accessing space and the benefits of space, we really have to talk about who's getting that data, how they're getting it, um, and how they're able to use it. And so I also want to make a point that this is both government and commercial data. And so it's really interesting what we're seeing in the news right now in terms of just the continuation of this innovation. Um, one of my favorites is looking at some of the private and um, commercial companies who are actually trying to work on global methane um, tracking and having built to order satellites that track global methane and answer a very specific problem regarding the climate change in terms of gathering that data and fixing it. Um, we've all seen the, the horrific stories on the wildfires here in the US and around the world. Um, space data is absolutely essential to managing and tracking uh, what's happening there, for instance. And so this gets coverage and it, it's understood and it's being used. I mean, it is a success story in that sense. However, uh, we do have to look at the broader stakeholder community, you know, who really is involved in this. And, and, it, and it, it's a huge community. And, and one of the things in the space world is we can all be a little insular. We sort of focus a little bit on what we do, you know, for launch or for security or for manufacturing or wherever you fit. Um, but it's important to think of space data as part of the larger ecosystem that we're talking about here. So we're talking about who has access um, we really have to think about the whole breadth of stakeholders. And so I've kind of laid them out here in a way that I think is useful for this conversation. So, you know, space infrastructure, the traditional space industry, um, you know, everything from actual government agencies to manufacturers to the actual operators, launch. Um, I've put investors here because we're talking about like how we get the data, how it's built, how it's launched, what's happening. Um, downstream and sort of that first level of what happens to data and who has access to it. Um, national Earth Observation Agencies are kind of an obvious one, but academia, national statistics agencies are incredibly involved these days in managing and, and using space data. And then analytics companies who are either, you know, buying the data or, or actually putting it up themselves. And so that kind of downstream market there. And then finally, your end users. And an end user for space data is, is an incredibly large category of people. Um, when we talk about end users, it's very easy to think of um, just the analysts, like people who are actually taking the data and processing it and maybe taking a look at it. But the reality is end user is a much broader category. Um, you know, we can be talking about government services agencies, we can be talking about NGOs um, at all levels of the nonprofits, you know, everything from a granting agency all the way down to a healthcare worker um, who's trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, reach a certain community. 
those those all count uh, as, as end users and at various levels. And they all have incredibly different needs when it comes to data. So just having the data isn't enough to get into the hands of all of these people um, that ideally would have it and would be able to use it. Um, and so I do want to talk about, you know, what does data democracy for space actually look like? Um, and I stole kind of a, a great summary of the, the kind of main topics for that uh, from the Committee on Earth Observation Satellite, CS, who does really great work on trying to think about how we get space data into the hands of people who need it. And they have sort of kind of four categories that are useful to think about. Data access, you know, who can get, you know, does is the data available for people to get in a, in a relatively cost-effective way or even free? Um, software tools, you know, can they process it? Can they use it? Can they do what they need to do with it? Um, data dissemination, are they able to get it out to the people that need it, you know, once it's been processed? And then can everybody actually know what to do with it, know what they're looking at, be able to put it um, to use for their purpose? And I think those are really great categories in terms of because there's access issues kind of at all four points. And then we're not going to get into, sorry, my light went off. Um, you know, we're not going to get into each of those points in, in detail, but it's important to note that each of those can be an obstacle point. Each of those can be a place where there is a challenge to space data democracy. And so just to give you an overview of what some of those challenges are. And again, I think it's one of those things where we in the space community often are, we're so excited. We, we think that this is so cool and it's fun and we're kind of, you know, nerds about all that. And that's great. The vast majority of end users, though, are not space people. They're not necessarily trained. Um, maybe they've had some GIS training, but the vast majority of people who actually need the data aren't space people. So what does it look like for them? And, and what are some of the things? And so this list here is a little bit focused on my first example of the SDGs and some of what are the challenges for getting data into development hands. But you would have a fairly similar, um, although different list, depending as you went through different sectors or wanted to focus on something like climate change. Um, we've talked a little bit about lack of technical knowledge and training. Um, I think that's a really big one. This is not integrated into to college courses on how to do jobs that have nothing to do with space. Um, it's, it's a core data set, but it's not necessarily viewed that way um, completely. There's also changing how we view things. When we saw those charts, we saw what a watershed moment, you know, the, the late 2000s and early 2010s are. And so this is still new. I and mean, here we are in 2021, that 10 years is not a long time <laughs> and it continues to change all the time. And so changing industries, helping people understand um, how this data can be useful and, and changing how we work in many areas, that's a slow process. Um, and it's something we have to think about when we're talking about um, creation of space data and, and what happens with it. Um, inertia, donor skepticism, government skepticism. Again, anytime you do something new or different, you're always gonna have skepticism. Uh, time and money is probably in my world the biggest one. Um, once upon a time, many years ago, I was a development worker in Afghanistan. And I was kind of aware that data existed and it would probably help me in fact I knew it would help me do my job because we couldn't get you know we, we had the classic problem of not being able to access certain areas but the time and effort it would have taken me at that moment to figure out what I could do and how I could do it and go through that process of learning for myself I mean I had a full-time job and we had to do the work and so that wasn't something that we were always able to do now, I mean that's changed I'm not saying that's the case everywhere all the time but it's important to understand that individuals around the world may need this data and that process of getting to it um, can be quite difficult. And then obviously just more technical concerns as well, like data integration or just having too much data. We're, we're making a lot and so sorting through it can be difficult. So that kind of gives you a taste of what we might be talking about when we talk about challenges. Um, another one I'd like to point out, um, you know, what happens if you Google something? You know, if we want this to be ubiquitous, if we want the space industry to be successful and to be able to have really great business plans, then they need all of these users. They need people being able to access it. And as I just pointed out, there are a lot of challenges. Um, there's a lot of amazing things being done. This is already changing, um, but there are a lot of challenges. And so something to really think about in terms of just basic access. Can something, you know, if I'm interested in this topic or if I work in this field, what happens when I put it into an internet search engine? Because that's what people do when they think or new or they're trying to learn these days. And so really trying to think about what resources are out there and how we as an industry represent ourselves, I think is really important. And then some thoughts on how we can overcome this. And, and for some people, depending on where you sit in the industry, this may not seem super important. You know, this might not be your job, but I think it's something we all have to think about. 
And if you're talking about launch, if you're talking about manufacturing setup, you're talking about how, what kind of data we're gonna build, um, how we overcome that access challenge when it comes to the actual products of space activity is really important. Um, and so I've talked a little bit about some of these. I, I think cross-sector training, I think more collaboration, um, better engagement with the media. There's a lot of, the media has grown pretty savvy in this and then there's a lot of really great uses of it. Um, but there's also, I would argue at the moment, kind of a bit of a backlash against space. Um, some of you know, the, the reporting is, is mixed right now. And to really talk about the benefits and what we're doing to overcome any of those challenges, I think is really important. Um, and, it's, and it involves a certain amount of self-reflection as an industry. And then I always like to end in terms of on you know, overcoming these challenges is not letting perfect or efficient be the enemy of good and effective. Um, this is an ongoing challenge. It's always going to be there. The data is changing, fields are changing, work is changing. Um, we can assess and we can consider and we can think all we want, but really it's, it's about figuring out pilots. It's about figuring out the next steps and, and moving forward and having kind of that continual evaluation cycle. And it's the same with satellites. I mean, the, the new data coming in is always going to um, push this, but we're never going to have the perfect pipeline. And so just making sure that we continue to expand access and expand who's seeing things, I think is particularly important. And then what I wanted, oh, one last slide on this topic um, before I switch a little bit to other challenges for um, space access. So this is, if you're particularly interested in this topic, this is a series that um, my organization and MIT Media Labs put together last year. Uh, you can access all of the videos online. We did uh, six uh, different sessions on different SDGs. So if that is particularly of interest to you and you want to really dive into one of those topics, I recommend taking a look at that. Now I kind of want to shift gears a little bit. And so pulling this back to Secure World's main mission, which is space sustainability, I think this is something that is also really important when we're talking about um, democratizing space access is space access overall. What could stop us? What, what could be the problems? You know, we, we have to really think about what does sustainability for this industry look like? You know, we have a, a very specific orbital environment, um, one that has a lot of potential challenges as we continue to expand um, space access and, and space uh, technologies and assets. And so my organization focuses a lot on what are the sustainability challenges? Where are the potential problems? How we might shoot our, you know, could we shoot ourselves in the foot and have problems with access um, down the line? And, and what does that look like? And so some areas for, for everyone to kind of think about for that orbital debris, generally people are fairly aware of that, but it is an ongoing concern um, and, and something that needs to be addressed uh, continually and, and sooner rather than later. Uh, we're also developing a lot of new technologies and with new technologies come new challenges. And so thinking about on-orbit servicing or um, debris removal, all of those things um, have a lot of possibilities, but also bring new challenges. Uh, counter space threats. This is something that if you're not into space security, you kind of don't think much about, but uh, we saw a few years ago with India's ASAT test, this is not a dead issue. And um, maintaining a, a usable environment uh, free from those kinds of threats is really important and would affect everyone. Spectrum use is another one that uh, we kind of all like to stick our head in the sand if it's not something we work on. Uh, but if we're launching satellites, they, they need spectrum to be able to communicate with Earth. And um, while the negotiations on technical things around that can be kind of boring for some of us, it's not something we can overlook. If we're talking about the future of this industry, uh, we have to be talking about spectrum. It is not an inexhaustible resource, and it is absolutely something um, that we need to think about for the future. And then space weather, um, satellites are affected by this. We are currently in solar maximus and heading to it right now. Um, that's something that can affect satellites, it can affect launch, um, and it can affect satellite services and other services here on Earth. And really understanding those dangers and, and making sure that we're prepared and mitigating those risks is also uh, very important. So that's just a flavor of some of the things that we work on. Um, this is the chart. I'm not going to go into every bullet on it. You can look at it later if you're interested. Um, but I think it's important to highlight, you know, there are tons of opportunities right now. It is an exciting time um, as more and more launch opportunities and, and new technologies are explored. There are so many possibilities with that. And so really seeing what those opportunities are and how they're going to affect our industry is exciting and important and really will bring benefit. But that doesn't mean that we can't um, look at some of these challenges and need to consider those. If we're talking about accessing space, then we have to talk about what can get in the way of that. And, and cost is, is one major concern, but it, it's far from the only one. And so this list of challenges is kind of just a very broad look at what it means to have an evolving space industry and, and where that goes and, and what that means. So 
Uh, one last resource that I wanted to highlight for you, anyone who's newer to the industry or, or still very much in a learning phase, or if you're kind of a deep into one issue, but interested in space sustainability and the law and these broader access challenges, I highly recommend you take a look at the Handbook for New Actors in Space. This is a free resource uh, that Secure World put out. Uh, you can download it online, or if you're part of a university or other group that would actually like some hard copies, you can reach out to me. Um, but this publication provides an overview of the principles, laws, norms, and best practices. Uh, for safe, predictable, and responsible activities in space. Um, we made this as kind of a recognition that we had this growing cadre of new actors, many of whom who don't come from the space community to begin with, or if they do, as I've said, you know, have a very specific view in that. So if you're interested in space sustainability and, and the environment there, um, I highly, take, uh, highly recommend this. Uh, it is also translated into Spanish. And within the next uh, couple of months, we are also gonna be releasing a French and Chinese version as well. So if you have any questions whatsoever, um, you can email me and reach out. I'm happy to have a longer conversation, but I wanted to give you a really broad overview of some of the other considerations for, for accessing space and, and what does that mean and, and what might be the challenges. Thank you so much, Crystal. So we do have one question. Um, and I believe this question is a little bit more directed to Randa. Um, do you also move your launch plan internationally? And could you theoretically launch from Nigeria for Nigeria, for example? Um, like physically and technologically, yes, we could move it anywhere in the world. Uh, but in terms of uh, regulatory issues, there, there may be uh, uh, some, some problems uh, with moving our, as uh, the State Department characterize them are ICBMs around the world because these are to us scientific tools but they have a dual use as weapons so uh, moving a rocket is not an easy or uh, uncomplicated task to move it internationally and that's uh, that's just you know just the nature of moving moving rockets internationally but I think anything can be uh, overcome in terms of any any hurdles, uh, you know, for using um, rockets for peaceful, educational, scientific purposes, and uh, I just think that moving rockets internationally means just another seven or eight layers of paperwork to get through. Thank you. Do you have anything to add to that, Crystal, from your perspective? Not on that particular question. Um, obviously, Secure World follows the launch industry quite carefully um, and is interested in a variety of areas there, but not so much from a business case perspective. Mm -hmm. But Nigeria has a great, uh, you know, great access straight south. So, I mean, that's a, it's a big advantage for them. And uh, there's a lot of interest in Nigeria currently uh, to do space education and uh, working with a, a group, a New Vision Institute, uh, that's just being formed uh, to do hands-on uh, satellite building and space training. But I, I like the fact that uh, uh, you know, these, uh, you know, our kits and other people who have satellite kits are, are kind of, um, you know, we we like to say it's it's, it's giving the, the guild knowledge or, or teaching them the black arts of satellite making because this is something that you don't generally find available, you know, in books. Now it's a little more pervasive, but at the beginning it was almost impossible to find out, well, what do you do? How do you build a satellite? And and I'll I'll just show you these these this is a CubeSat from one of our CubeSats. This is the actual size, you know, they're 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 tiny tiny, you know, and, and people think, well, can you do anything with that? And um, yeah, you can do something with that. And you can do something with our, our tube set, which is even smaller. You can say hi to it, you know, several times a day, or, or it can, uh, you know, monitor crops for you, or it can send out messages of peace, like the uh, group of 11-year-olds from Brazil uh, did from, with their Tancredo set. Um, if you want to think small, you know, look at this. This is a chipset. This is a satellite 
from Ambasat. Uh, they're a group that's launching with us from the UK. And uh, that is actually a satellite. So the technology is um, you know, miniaturizing and, and that's driven really a lot of innovation in, in uh, the miniaturization of, of uh, electronics in general to serve this new market. So it's, it's really pretty fascinating how, uh, how the whole sector has uh, you know, exploded in a good way. <laughs> uh, but, um, but Crystal had a lot of good points there with them. Um, like you know the the sustainability and uh, you know are are we going to make low Earth orbit so crowded that no one will be able to access it for that reason? Uh, well, we are in at in orbital. Uh, we we built our business plan around uh, launching launching satellites to do a short term mission to either you know, test equipment or prove a point or you know, advertise a product or whatever use the, the owner might have. Uh, but to do that in, in, in say a month and then deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere and, uh, you know, kind of like the self-cleaning of it of the low earth orbit, but to get, get rid of the, 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 again, the scientific instrument that then becomes debris, you know, if it's, um, you know, no longer functioning. So uh, we um, were very, very aware of that, and uh, we just put it in an orbit that gives it a shorter lifespan, and that, that I think is responsible spacing, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's definitely something to think about. You know, we we as I said, we we believe in in using space for benefit, and that means figuring out how to manage all of this. And so, I think it's absolutely important to acknowledge um, the value that comes from experimental satellites or student-driven satellites or small cubesats. You know. There is a ton of evidence that that kind of engagement early on really leads to a changing, um, a changing industry, and we're really supportive. I mean, that's part of what I, I happened to mention our handbook at the end, and that's exactly why. Because if that's the thing you're interested in, we just want everyone to understand, you know, where they fit into that ecosystem, and so that we all can behave responsibly and can continue to figure out what that is. Um, but I think students and, and young companies are often quite committed to this. Um, we, we don't see a lack of interest. Um, it's just about figuring it out and, and seeing what that looks like and, and making it happen. Yeah. You know, one other thing I'd like to mention is, is you know, people think of space flight and they think, oh, it's gr a gross polluter. You're, you know, you're, you're, you know, using all these chemicals and terrible things that are, you know, like destroying the environment. Well, we look at, we look at space flight as the potential savior of the earth by, by being the uh, kind of the relief valve that removes people from Earth and takes them to other planets, you know, thereby, you know, reducing the Earth population and putting people out into the solar system, and uh, you know, I think that's a, that's a needed uh, a needed service. So, and other people feel that same way who are in the launch business. Yeah, I can respond to one of the questions in the chat. Um, I see that there's one about why a country or agency might decide to invest in their own satellite rather than existing services, especially outside of academic learning. I think it's a great question. Um, the answer is kind of complex. Uh, part of it, I think, is, is prestige. Um, I, you know, we've looked into this issue and, and kind of assessed it in the sense that some of it's prestige. Um, sometimes it's driven kind of by military and regional considerations. Um, it's easy to think of this on a global level, but a lot of those decisions are driven uh, by regional considerations, so competition between neighbors. I mean, some of the, the same concepts that spurred the initial space race between the U.S. and Russia, and to a certain extent China, um, they, the, the same motivations apply to other countries. It's just done on a, a somewhat smaller scale. Um, that said, that's not the only reason. And, and so at times, it's also a dependency issue. Um, it's an access issue. And so it really depends on exactly what type of satellite you're talking about. Um, at times, it's an attempt to really get specific satellites. At times, it's an attempt to control it um, or to fill a particular, a particular thing. And also, now that the opportunities are more available, now that some of these costs are coming down, um, that really just opens up the door to more specific satellites. Um, some of the really interesting stuff, not so much on the country level, uh, that I've been really following is to start to see made to order satellites to really identify gaps in the data and then create something reasonably, I mean, reasonable, um, that, that fills that. And I, I think I mentioned um, 
methane sat and GHG sat in some of those companies. But methane sat in particular is, is a great example of one that is not a company and it, it's not a country. It's, it's an industry. It's an, um, I'm not sure what they're actually classified as, but like essentially a nonprofit um, that's figured out that there's a need for this and is, is working with the right people from a technological perspective to fulfill that need. And so it's really all of those things taken together on a case-by-case on -case basis. Yeah, it's a whole new world, and, and uh, you know, uh, the the data is the uh, the new gold, right? And uh, that is um, uh, obviously all of it can be monetized and uh, used for uh, you know creating wealth uh, worldwide, uh, which is always a good thing, and and doing all the uh, all the great uh, functions that that you were talking about earlier in the uh, you know like just. Uh, you can monitor disaster zones. You can, you know, uh, uh, see if crops are going to be, you know, uh, giving the yield that uh, people expect in a certain amount of months. Uh, the incursion of, you know, salt water into fresh water, you know, that sort of that sort of thing. All these things that are, you know, that were pretty much um, impossible to do before are now, you know, magically almost, uh, uh, you know, available. And, uh, and in many cases, that data is free. So I think that's, um, that's great. You know, some people need specific data. And, and again, that generally costs. But there's a lot of, of uh, information. In fact, probably, as you mentioned, probably too much data out there uh, to be sifted through that, uh, again, could turn into other industries. You know, just, just mining that data that's already been collected. Yeah, so it's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it is absolutely, and that's kind of why I wanted to touch on data demand. I lost your your audio. Oh. Yeah. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Yeah. Hear you, Crystal. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's a great point, and that's part of the reason I wanted to touch on data democracy in my presentation as well, because it's easy to think about we get it up, it works, therefore we're done. Um, and that's not the case. If we're really talking about benefits and access to space and to space technology and space data, we really have to think about. Um, the processes uh, by which it actually gets into people's hands. Okay. Good. Cool. So we have. Yeah. We also have another question for you, Randa. Um, uh -huh. Terry is asking, can you add a tracker on your rocket bodies? The new models of these comms are lightweight and tiny. That way we can see and find you. And then he says, are maybe upper stages or your cubes? Well, you people generally will put uh, some sort of identifying uh, beacon or uh, you know other other method of uh, or, or, or a repeating RF signal uh, to to allow them to track their their personal satellites, right? And um, you know, in terms of uh, finding out where our uh, satellite or rocket would be, is um, you know there there are government agencies that actually you know put out the locations of objects in space. So you would be able to find it with a, a TLE, it's called. Uh, so you would be able to find uh, the location of um, you know, rocket stages or, or spacecraft. And you know, sometimes it's you know, the, the small sats and you know, CubeSats, TubeSats are considered uh, too small to track. Uh, but actually that there's a lot of work that's been done in that, that area and now that's possible, but um, um, there are ways. Yes, you can, you can track. And we have a follow-up question to the first question about um, why is there interest currently about Nigeria for a space station? Uh, that's been going on for quite a while. Uh, Nigeria has been a been a player, and and again, I think it's you know it's location, 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 right? It's um, if you have a, if you have a clear path to a sought after, uh, you know, a sought after orbital inclination for satellite launch, uh, it's a natural. So people are going to look at it. You've got uh, the country's borders, and you know, uh, gives you a you know an ocean aspect. And gives you a, a um, you know the uh, again the, the proper inclination for polar orbits and sun synchronous orbits. So it's it's um, you know also the mindset of the people uh, 
Nigerians I've talked to are very, very excited about moving into the future. So uh, that's something that, you know, we feel compelled to help facilitate. And uh, we're happy to do that. And again, there are many, uh, many international uh, uh, regulations, again, that, that have to be followed and have to be uh, adhered to uh, for good reason. You know? uh, but again, uh, if you're, you're dealing with uh, you know, legitimate uh, uh, institutions and, and uh, right-minded players, I, I think that can all be can all be worked. So we're, we're happy to work with people from all over the world. And as we do now with our, with our satellite kits. I can actually jump in on another comment. I saw a comment in the chat. So it's been a question, um, but I saw someone comment a comment on the space race. And I, I think it's interesting. Um, I touched on this a tiny bit in my presentation, but I actually think this is really important. Um, you know, I'm obviously excited about a lot of the new ways to access space for human exploration. I mean, I, I personally am super excited about that. But I will say I'm a little concerned about the um, impression that, that it's is giving in the current context of the world. Um, and I, I do think there's a bit of a problem. I recently had um, held um, in partnership with the UK embassy an event on climate change um, heading into the COP26 in Glasgow um, in November. And you know, well attended, very interested, had some great speakers really talking about all the different ways that space is valuable for climate change and what's happening in the future and where we're going. And it was, just, it was great. We got a lot of questions about the CO2 emissions of rockets. And, and to me, that says a lot about where some of the public thinking is and what's happening in social media. And, and again, I don't think the space industry has anything to apologize for that anyone's doing anything wrong exactly. But I absolutely think it's something we need to be thinking of in, the, in this topic of accessing it. You know, is this available to everyone? Are, is space available to everyone? And are the benefits of space available to everyone? And do people understand that? I, I think it's a huge topic. Um, and I, I think it's something that we as an industry need to be thinking more about because we don't want to lose the social media battle in the long run here. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who, who think of space right now and and have some real misconceptions about what it is and, and what value it brings for, for people on earth. And so I, I don't know that there's anything I would say beyond that, but I, I thought it was a great comment and I, I just wanted to emphasize that. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then you look at uh, you look at a rocket launch, you know, which lasts, uh, you know, seconds, right? <laughs> or a couple of minutes. And then you look at um, comparative cargo transportation systems, say, in a, an oil tanker or something that is like constantly churning out emissions. Uh, it seems almost insignificant in terms of uh, emissions uh, you know, because of the basic short duration of what a, what a rocket launch is. But the benefits that come from it are, you know, I'll sh dare I say astronomical, but, but they are, uh, they're, they're um, uh, you know, the, and again, the data that comes from weather observation, the, the benefit to mankind in terms of uh, all, all um, again, uh, I think most importantly, weather prediction and, and everything that is based in space now, uh, if we didn't have that, what kind, of, what, kind of, what kind of peril would be, be in store? It would be in store for the, you know, the whole population of the planet. I mean, it's, it's, um, uh, it's an indispensable tool. And I think the, the level of emissions that come out of it are, again, insignificant compared to other transportation systems. And I'll go back to that, you know, exporting humans to other planets, which I think is, uh, you know, the, the uh, well, it's the main goal of our company, eventually to have, uh, have a transportation system, at least between earth and moon, uh, and have a moon base that is a destination for science and tourism and, you know, just human habitation. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that doing, uh, doing the hard work of ex exploration, you know, uh, I think we can live with a little bit of CO2. Well, and it, it, it's not even accurate. 
too, right? Like, you know, how much CO2 is actually emitted, it depends on the rocket, it depends on the company. I mean, it's very complicated. And as I, I agree, it's, it's, yeah. but it, to me, it was more of an indicator as well of where some of the public sentiment is right now and, and what's happening and, you know, where money is being spent. I mean, there are a lot of problems on earth. And it's mm -hmm. important for us to tie the value of space to helping solve mm -hmm. those problems because otherwise spending money on space starts to seem like a distraction. We should be spending that money on problems on earth, not, you know, for people to do whatever they want in space. And I, I'm not, I don't agree with that. I think that's not the case. Mm -hmm. but I, I want to be sure in the long term um, that we position ourselves as an industry so people understand that that's not what's happening and that the, the right, yeah. for space have to do with, yeah. you know, assisting people. Yeah, and you you know you get kind of a circus atmosphere going on with the you know the initial um, you know super fun floating around in a capsule space flights you know that kind of thing, but but all of that you know we we see those flights as really as test flights for vehicles that will eventually take people again to the moon to Mars to the cloud cities of Venus and to Titan you know and and you know all the places that that we'd all like to go. But um, that will be that will be something that again is becomes more accessible as more players are involved in the field, and and more people, you know, you know, competition will drive the prices down. We're really coming in at a, at an incredibly low cost compared to everyone else because we've worked to make this vehicle you know, as again, as radically simplified as possible. Uh, no easy task, right? You know, it doesn't happen overnight, but it is, um, you know, it's working and, it, and it's, um, it's something that uh, you know, will benefit the world in the long run. Ladies, we have two minutes left and I'm gonna sneak in um, this question um, at the end. So, Going back to a little bit of the Nigeria conversation and what makes a desirable launch site? What are some desirable conditions for launch sites? Well, ideally no population surrounding it. And um, you know, the, the FAA and AST, which is the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, the entity that licenses space launch. Um, those folks like the fact that we are doing ocean launch. And in fact, we received our first launch license in the year 2000. So that's how long we've been at this. And that was actually a, um, you know, that was for an ocean launch. Uh, and, you know, it for us as, as an operator, it's a benefit because we, we pay a very low insurance rate, which you have to pay when you get a license. There's a insurance amount that you need to get for third party liability to protect the public, et cetera. And, and, you know, they see our launching in an unpopulated zone like that as, as, as very wise. So, uh, you know, and, for, and again, for us, it's, it's um, um, you know, what makes a great launch site? Well, you know, ideally, uh, you know, the, the, the need that we can fill from that launch site, if it's, if it's a, um, you know, some kind of a fast reaction that needs to be done in terms of uh, maybe somebody has a satellite constellation and they need to replenish that constellation because one of the nodes has malfunctioned. Uh, and you, if you can send a, a rocket up in a matter of hours, that, you know, that space asset uh, remains functioning. You know, if not, you know, it may, simply, you know, cease to, cease to exist. So, you know, things of that nature are, are important to us. Thank you, Randa. Thank you, Crystal. And thank you for everyone that attended today um, on this session. I think it was someone mentioned, I think it was great to hear these perspectives and it just so happened, you two happen to be ladies. Um, and so being able to show different facets of, um, of how space is accessible for everybody. Have a great day, everyone.